Welcome to our online worship experience for the weekend of September 27th. I am Pastor Katerina and I'm excited for you to be joining us today. Pastor Bill is on vacation this week, but he will be back on October 4th to serve COVID-approved communion at our in-person worship service on World Communion Sunday. Next Sunday also marks the Feast of St. Francis on our liturgical calendars, and we invite you to celebrate by bringing your pets both to the online worship service and the in-person worship service for a blessing of the animals. I know Serene has really been enjoying this chance to worship. Finally, we would love for you all to be involved at Jesse Lee with your time and talents. Please check out our websites for opportunities for fellowship, service, and ways to support our ministries through our tithes and offerings. Let us continue in worship. to worship. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in this way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. Please pray with me. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
please join me in our time of confession. Almighty God, we confess that we are often swept up in the tide of our generation. We have failed in our calling to be your holy people, a people set apart for your divine purpose. We live more in apathy born of fatalism than in passion born of hope. We are moved more by private ambition than by social justice. We dream more of privilege and benefits than of service and sacrifice. We try to speak in your name without relinquishing our glories, without nourishing our souls, without relying wholly on your grace. Help us to make room in our hearts and lives for you. Forgive us, revive us, and reshape us in your image. Amen. In the silence of these moments, let us confess our sins to our loving Lord. Hear now the good news, that God the Father, the great physician of the soul, loves you so much that he sent Christ Jesus to heal us and reinstate the image of God within us. May the Almighty and merciful Lord grant us remission of all our sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now let us pray as Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning's reading is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. Imitating Christ's humility. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Here ends the scripture reading, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I will confess to you that it feels strange to be standing before you today as a pastor and preacher of the good news. 
While it always feels strange to be immersed in the world of the Bible, and while it certainly feels strange for me as a recent seminary graduate to be using the fruits of my education, my strange feeling comes from standing before you all in particular. For those who do not know me, I am a Ridgefield native and have been a member of Jesse Lee Memorial since I was in high school. Jesse Lee is the place where I first discerned a call to ministry in the United Methodist Church. And it was within Jesse Lee that I received affirmation and encouragement to pursue my call with fear and trembling. During the years that I have been away, first at Baylor University and then Duke Divinity School, I have held you all in my heart as you have held me in your hearts, all in preparation for this, to stand in the pulpit of my hometown, my home community. It's a strange feeling indeed. In fact, when my husband James and I were first discerning whether to come to Jesse Lee to live out our calls here, Pastor Bill encouraged this strange feeling by reminding me of how Jesus was received in his hometown. Anyone recall? Unlike on Palm Sunday, those in Nazareth did not welcome Jesus with joyful praises and shouts of blessed is the king. Rather, in response to his reading of the scripture and his teaching, they angrily got up, drove Jesus out of the town, and devised a plan to hurl him off of a cliff. Which, if you ask me, is not the most comforting story to be reminded of before you preach in your own hometown. Nevertheless, I am hopeful that we can get through this sermon without you all devising a plan to throw me off of a cliff in Danbury. Our scripture reading for today comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians, and frankly, it is a dream passage for a recent seminary graduate. Within a few verses, Paul beautifully captures the Christian story in which we profess our faith, that Jesus, that the Messiah, though in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself. That unlike humanity, unlike you and me, who saw our being made in the image of God as an opportunity to become gods ourselves, Christ was born in human likeness. Christ, though a king, took the form of a slave. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. And in response, God the Father exalted him, gave him the name above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend and every tongue should confess that Jesus, the Messiah, the self-emptying, crucified God, is Lord of all. And Paul does all of this within six verses. And it's not just me who is impressed with Paul's pithiness here. Within scholarly circles, these verses, Philippians 2, 6 through 11, have taken on a life of their own. They even have their own name. Scholars refer to these verses as the Christ hymn because Paul's words in these verses take on the form of a hymn. They stand out from the rest of the prose in Philippians as poetic and confessional, and some even suspect that Paul did not write the hymn himself. That instead, in speaking to the Philippians, Paul references a well-known hymn that circulated in the early church. Perhaps the Philippians knew these words so well that they could say it with him. Just as you could finish this sentence, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that I really hope you all did that from your side of the monitor. I'm gonna assume you got the words. That saved a wretch like me. They could participate in Paul's words. That is with one caveat. Many think that Paul adds his own words to this well-known hymn, and they are found in verse eight, when Paul pauses and reminds his audience that Jesus was not just obedient to the point of death, but even death on a cross. That line, even death on a cross, interrupts the poetic flow of the hymn. It would be as if I was talking to you all today and said, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, like the sound of the angels singing that saved a wretch like me. Or if I said, silent night, holy night, that night sky in Bethlehem, 
all is calm, all is bright, you would be taken aback. I just interjected my own words into a hymn that we share, a hymn that is so ingrained in us. And you might rightly ask, why did Pastor Katerina add those words? Surely the hymn was fine as it was. Likewise, why did Paul interrupt a shared hymn with the line, even death on a cross? And let's say it wasn't a shared hymn. Let's say Paul composed the entirety of the Christ hymn. Why did he feel the need to slow down, to interrupt his poetic flow, to remind us how Jesus died? Have you ever noticed that attendance on an Easter Sunday service is far greater than attendance on a Good Friday service? We might ask, why is that? Perhaps we prefer to attend Easter services because of the pretty pastels or because it serves as the perfect family gathering before we go on our egg hunts and our ham lunches. But I'd like to think it's more than that. We like Easter because it's triumphant, it's climactic. It is the most climactic moment in our story. It is verses nine through 11 in the Christ hymn where God highly exalts Jesus gives him the name above every name. Every knee bends and every tongue proclaims that Jesus is Lord of all. Jesus is risen, triumphant over death. What a positive, optimistic thing to believe in. And in general, we in America like positive, happy stories. What is the American dream if not a happy story that ends with a glorious outcome? In attending our Easter services and forgoing Good Friday, we get to sit comfortably in Christ's glory. We, are allow, we can allow ourselves to forget that what preceded Christ's glory was Christ's death. Christ's death on a cross. It is far more agreeable, far more comfortable to put our faith in a risen God than a crucified God. But fortunately for us, Paul does not allow us to be at ease. He slows down his hymn right before the moment of glorification and he stops and makes us sit with the truth that yes, Jesus was obedient to the point of death, but it was no ordinary death. It was death on a cross. As modern readers, it might be hard for us to grasp just how significant this line is. Now we look to the cross as a beautiful reminder of Christ. Our churches are decorated with extravagant, gorgeous crosses. We even wear them as jewelry. But the cross was far from beautiful and it was far from holy. No one of honor died from crucifixion. The Romans reserved it for criminals and slaves and never never for their own citizens. To die on the cross was to die a public death, to be branded as an outcast, a scumbag, subhuman, and then to hang naked, vulnerable, in a heavily trafficked area for the whole world to see you as you likely choked to death. And it's not only that, but the one being crucified would have to carry their own cross to the sight of their own crucifixion, they would carry their own instrument of death. Often they would be whipped beforehand, their strength taken away, so they would be unable to carry the cross themselves. And our scriptures even attest to this when Jesus relied on Simon of Cyrene to bear his cross. It was violent and it was considered disgraceful. Our scriptures even say anyone hung on a tree is under God's curse. Jesus' death on a cross marked him as a curse. As Fleming Rutledge puts it, most of us are conditioned to think of Jesus' death as the scandal, when in fact it is not the death in itself, but the mode of the death that creates offense. So when Paul interrupts the hymn to remind us of the cross, he reminds us of the offense. He reminds us of the scandal that the God in whom we profess faith brought salvation through humiliation, through a criminal's punishment, 
through a cursed death, through a death that those in higher society would prefer not to speak about because it was too vulgar. As Paul writes in his letter to the Corinthians, the God we believe in chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to, to reduce to nothing things that are. Paul wants us to know that there is no Easter Sunday without Good Friday. He wants us to know that the resurrection means nothing apart from the crucifixion. That what we call God's grace came through an object of disgrace. I had a professor at Duke Divinity School who shared this story with us one day. In his church, he was serving communion and there was a little girl in the congregation. She stood in line and waited to receive her bread, hands outstretched like this. And with bread in hand, she went to my professor who showed her the cup. She took the bread and she dipped it into the cup. And when she did that, he said to her, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. And he said that and she pulled the bread out of the cup and she winced in disgust. She got it. Let us pray. Let us remember Jesus, who though he was rich, yet for our sakes became poor and dwelt among us, who is content to be subject to his parents, the child of a poor couple's home, who lived for 30 years the common life, earning his living with his own hands and declining no humble tasks, whom the people heard gladly for he understood their ways. May this mind be in us which was in Jesus Christ. Let us remember Jesus, who was mighty indeed, healing the sick and the disordered, using for others the powers he would not invoke for himself, who refused to force people's allegiance, who was master and lord to his disciples, yet was among them as their companion, as one who served, whose desire was to do the will of God who sent him. Let us remember Jesus, who loved people, yet retired from them to pray, rose a great while before day, watched the night, stayed in the wilderness, went up into a mountain, saw a garden, who, when he would help a tempted disciple, prayed for him, who prayed for the forgiveness of those who reject him and for the perfecting of those who received him, who observed the traditions, but de defied convention that did not serve the purposes of God, who hated the sins of pride and selfishness, of cruelty, and purity. Let us remember Jesus, who believed in people and never despaired of them, who through all disappointment never lost heart, who disregarded his own comfort and convenience and thought first of others' needs, and though he suffered long, was always kind, who when he was reviled, uttered no harsh word in return, and when he suffered, did not threaten retaliation, 
who humbled himself and carried obedience to the point of death, even death on the cross, wherefore God has highly exalted him. Let us unite in prayer that Christ may dwell in our hearts. O Christ, our only Savior, so come to dwell in us, that we may go forth with the light of your hope in our eyes and with your faith and love in our hearts. God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.